With us now is a lady whose name is Anna Maria Cardinale, and she is she toured the world as a classical guitarist and opera singer while working in counterterrorism for the FBI. So not only can she play the guitar, she can apparently shoot a gun real well. She has written this new book, though, that's not about shooting guitar, shooting <laughs> guns or <laughs> don't want to shoot guitars. Well, some people do, but that's another story. You don't want to shoot guns or play guitars. But her book is on music and the meaning in the mass, which is available from Sophia Institute Press. Anna Maria, I'm sorry for my awkward introduction. <laughs> Father, that was not an awkward introduction. It might be the coolest introduction I've ever received. <laughs> and I'm so honored for the opportunity to visit with you. You know, I guess I read about you. You you talked about two million people every day just driving home in their cars. What an incredible incredible source of truth you are to the world. I'm super excited and super honored and super humbled to get the chance to visit with you. Well, you know, as I've read your book, and as a priest, uh, what I've noticed is that what you're saying is a spot on the whole understanding of the Mass. Uh, the whole, if you will, introduction of divine grace does have a role in the music. You mentioned in your introduction um, the notion how uh, Jay Leno once said this. He says, you know, music is important. And then he showed a battle scene with the music from uh, Car- Carmina Burana, and then he showed it with Karma Chameleon, the same thing, and how when you saw those same images with those two different music forms of music, you saw two different pictures. That's it. That's what it comes down to, Father. And we're so susceptible to those alterations in our perception as human beings. We either see something as important or as unimportant based on the sort of the trappings that surround it, don't we? We sure do, and it becomes very clear with that in terms of. Um, you know, one of the things, of course, when I was growing up, I, well, you know, we spent a lot of time at guitar masses and those things, and we learned the songs. And I didn't realize until about five years ago, the song Here I Am, Lord, actually has about the same melody as the Brady Bunch theme song. And so to to lower the mass to the level of the Brady Bunch theme song by singing Here I Am, Lord, it really kind of shook me up and said, what are we doing with our music here that this is what we're thinking about? <laughs> Oh, Father, that's funny. I never even came to realize that myself. Um, and, you know, and, and here's the thing, Father. I don't want to argue that it's about, when we talk about the level of the music, I'm not talking about either the style or the sophistication of the music. In other words, I'm not saying, oh, we all need to get a bunch of Juilliard trained uh, professionals to come into player music, or I'm not saying, oh, it all needs to be of this style or another. I mean, each parish knows what style is appropriate to its particular congregation. What I am saying in the book, though, is that music does some very, very specific things to our perceptions. It affects our, 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 our physical feelings, it affects our bodies, it affects our emotions, and it affects our intellectual perceptions of things. And if we choose or perform music in the Mass that doesn't make sure those aspects of music's language are uh, attuned, that they communicate the same message as the sacred text, regardless of their style, then what we get is that very kind of funny, odd Jay Leonard movement w- moment where you're looking at, you know, a battle scene and hearing Karma Chameleon, and, and your brain doesn't know how to put the two together. So the assumption your brain makes is, well, then this must be trivial, this must be unimportant, nobody's getting hurt in the battle. No, nah, that's, not, that's not the mass. Well, and you have, you kind of developed for the, again, this book is written for all people, but especially for music directors. You bring about the musical trinity that's involved with the words of rhythm and harmony and melody. Yes, yes. Do you want me to kind of explain those those, those three? I, I, I think it would be very helpful. You know, all of us, when we think about it, we know these things. We just don't take the time to think about them. But the first way that music communicates to us is with rhythm. And what rhythm does is it influences our bodies. That's why music is so useful uh, for physical things. In other words, music can rock a baby to sleep, or music can uh, make us all march in time, can't it? Um, it? It tells us the music's rhythm tells us what to do with our bodies. Similarly, music's harmony tells us um, something about how to feel emotionally. Um, there's a lot of times on the Internet people will have a lot of fun because they will play major songs in minor keys or minor songs in major keys. And when you change the way music is harmonized, 
you change how it makes you feel. I, I joke in the book that you can make a, a horror movie theme sound uplifting or, you know, a happy song sound heartbreaking just on how it's harmonized. And thirdly, the third piece of that, that trinity, as you call it, is, is melody. And what melody does is it appeals to our intellects. It, it, it opens up and wakes up our problem-solving and predictive abilities in our minds. And music does all of these things without us. Um, it happens automatically within the way our body works. It happens before we even have the chance to think about it. Music is communicating messages to us on those three levels, those very, very powerful three levels. And those levels, Father, they happen regardless of any text you assign to the music. That's just music purely itself. So when music uses those three spheres of influence to say the same thing the text does, then you get something extremely powerful. Then you get something that helps us understand what the situation is. Kind of like, you know, when you watch an opera and suddenly start crying at the most implausible plot line, because the music's making you do that. Music is very effective when it coincides with the message of the text it's supporting. But when it doesn't coincide, Father, that's when something goes wrong in our understanding. And Father, sometimes I think that the lack of Eucharistic devotion these days, the lack of understanding that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist, can be attributed in a great deal to the music with which we surround that moment in the Mass. Because it's music often that tells people that, eh, nothing really important is happening here, that, that can't be God. Does that make any sense? Oh, it makes a lot of sense. I know here in Cincinnati, uh, we have a, a pretty strong community of, of uh, people from Ghana, from Africa. And uh, about four years ago, uh, no longer than that, I guess about 15, Archbishop Polarczyk, uh, who recently died, had the Mission Mass, and he, they had the musicians from Ghana. So they were doing the Mass, you know, in the in the African uh, approach. And in the process of that, part of the, the, tr- the tr- tradition of the Ghana people is that whenever the king walked in, there was a pounding of drums to show that this is a powerful moment the king is now present. And fortunately, they didn't tell this to the archbishop. And so when they get to the moment of, he, of the consecration and holding up the host, they start. They they have that very specific uh, rhythm of the drums. And I, I thought the archbishop was going to jump out of his skin because they didn't tell him this was going to happen. But this was the Ghanaian culture's way of using that rhythm to say, the king is here. This is a different life now. Oh, that is so, so beautiful. And what an incredible example, too, Father, of why we can't mandate style, per se, in the liturgy. Because different cultures have different ways of using the language of music to say what's going on. So we need to, we need to do exactly what you're saying. We need to let the, ma- the music of the Mass speak the language of the culture that, that will interpret it. Uh, what a beautiful example. Gosh, uh, so many African cultures really... Uh, do the music of the liturgy a lot more effectively, I might dare to say, than we do, because they're very, very musical cultures who express themselves well that way. We're, we've gotten kind of namby-pamby about our music. Well, I think, um, Anna Maria, we've lost our sense of the transcendent of going outside of ourselves. Music takes of us outside of ourselves. God draws us out of ourselves, and in a materialistic world, we're all in on ourselves. We're all very much centered, and nothing, nothing can lead us out and there's too much gravity pulling us down too much uh whether it's uh, immediate uh, satisfaction or whatever it is it pulls us down so when you begin to talk about the mysticism of the musician and the mysticism of the mass i can begin to see how you move towards a little bit more of a carmelite approach of the transcendence of opening up the door so that god can come in that's exactly what I hope to communicate in the book, Father, except you just explained it better than I could have. That was, that's exactly what I'm hoping to get to. So, you know, in the process of this, when you talk about, again, the mysticism of the Mass, people, again, they say they don't see that uh, oftentimes because, as you know, it's been described as the banality of the Mass, or things are just kind of done, done haphazard, or the music is just, uh, you know, there's a cognitive dissonance that's going on, uh, as you as you have said. Uh, do you have, I know you, you, this book, uh, does it provide solutions for us to help regain this view? Oh, Father, that's exactly what it provides, and, and that's, why, that's why I wrote it. I wrote it for those solutions, uh, because honestly, they're very, very simple solutions. And 
they're truly very technical solutions. It's in the musician's hand to make that transition back uh, to transcendence and to mysticism in the Mass. And uh, when I say the musician, I mean the person in the choir, but I also mean, you know, the person in the pew. Because if we're participating in the sung response of the Mass, we're, we're participating in it musically, and we need to be. So what this book offers is solutions in two ways. It offers the musician the technical solutions to make sure that the uh, rhythm, harmony, and melody, the influence of their music, aligns with the sacred text of the Mass. And then it provides some ways to understand the text of the Mass that they may have not been engaged with before, so that they know how to communicate the true meaning of those texts musically. And, Father, none of these things are difficult. I mean, I, I think it's a short little, really, it's quite a short little book, but it can change. If you participate in the mass musically at all, it can change the way you do it because it gives you the simple tools to make those exactly the transition that you're talking about. Well, I think you can just see it just in terms of, of certain hymns, you know, or in funerals or in uh, great moments of Mass, like a First Communion, with all of a sudden now at the very end, uh, it's sung Ave Verum Corpus, the great Eucharistic hymn, and it's, and it's done chorally, but it's, it's done in such a way that when it's done, it's silent. It, people can only respond with silence because they have been brought, you know, to the to the edge of heaven. And, you know, musically, not just with the words, but musically, because the words are in Latin and they may not know the words. But to have that glimpse, it's brought them, you know, on the on the cusp of, of, of mysticism. Yes, 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 Father. And, and the merits is, is the answer to everything the mystic soul longs for. And yet we, our souls, don't even know these days. No one, no one talks about mysticism. Nobody talks about the journey of the soul. Nobody talks about union with God and, and, and the degrees to which it can be, it's possible to attain in this life, but we have to strive through toward it. No one talks about those things. But the Church in its wisdom, commu- the, the, the Mass actually is capable of communicating all those truths to a soul through its music. But we don't even know that. We don't even try at it. So that's another thing that this book book tries to address. Well, we've been talking here today with Anna Maria Cardinale about her book, Music and Meaning in the Mass. I highly recommend this book. We'll have a link to purchase the book on our show notes at Sacred Heart Radio. Anna Maria, it's been an honor to talk to you with today. If people want to find out more about you or your project uh, of a private re- association of the faithful, where can people go for that? Uh, you know, it's they can just Google my name, Anna Maria Cardinale, or if they go to the Sophia site, um, that's sophiainstitute.com slash music and meaning, they can follow the links there as well as look at the book. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. Father, thank you so much.